This is a very special Sabbath because it is Easter celebration weekend. And we are just so glad that you are joining us. We're going to have a special program today, which means our Understandable series is going to finish up next weekend with part seven. Also, our you kids or our children's department, is it's really cool they're having special things in, during Sabbath school time in the individual Sabbath school. So that, that's gonna be a great. So it's gonna be a wonderful Easter weekend and we're so glad you're here. And speaking of children, there is a really special Sabbath coming up. Take a look at this video. Good morning, church family. I am here with a few members of the Children's Choir, and we are here to tell you about... International Sabbath! That's right. On April 20, we would like to invite wow, you... Wow, you guys look amazing! Oh my goodness, is this the new kids' choir outfit? We're talking about International Sabbath. On April 20th. Hmm. Where's your outfit? You mean I get to wear one too? Okay, well don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. We would like to invite all of you. A whole church. Pastors, Sabbath school teachers, parents, all of you. To join us in celebrating the different cultures and ethnicities that make up the Loma Linda University Church family. We would like to invite you to come dressed in the colors and patterns and traditional dress of your cultural heritage. How blessed are we to be a part of such a diverse family? What countries are you representing? Japan, Korea, Bolivia, and Thailand. So April 20, International Sabbath, the Children's Choir and your pastors would encourage you to make a day of it. Come to church that morning in your traditional wear, plan an international potluck with your Sabbath school friends, sing praises to him in your native tongue. However you choose to do it, join us in the celebration of God's great big family. See you then. Next, we announced it last week. There's a brand new adult Sabbath school called the Upper Room. It's going to start April 13, and it's going to be actually on the new ministry building roof. And just note the time. It'll start at 1015 and finish at 1130. But that starts April 13, the Upper Room Sabbath School. Yeah, that's actually right above us. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> We have a really incredible seminar coming up, Untangling Our Relationships. And here is Jamie Sadola and Dr. Brian Kafferke to give you more information. I'm here with Brian Kafferke, and I would like Brian to tell us who is this seminar for? This seminar is for people who are in relationships, not romantic relationships, not marriage relationships, but any relationship. So if you find yourself in tricky relationships with a roommate or a sibling or a parent or a child, this seminar is for you because we're talking about new paradigms for understanding how those relationships work. Oftentimes we engage in some tricky dynamics and we find ourselves caught in these tricky relationships. So I'm gonna teach you new ways to understand how to back yourself out of those so you can engage in new and more meaningful ways. So Brian, for the person that's reluctant to come to this seminar, what would you tell them? Well, you're gonna learn some really practical tools you'll be able to apply immediately in your relationships. You'll learn how to understand some of the 3D topography of these relationships so you can choose to behave in a different way. You'll also learn how these anxieties that people have can be transferred onto you mm -hmm. and how you can stop that flow of anxiety so you don't take home excess anxiety that's not actually yours. So this relationship seminar is for everyone and anyone, for you to be able to understand relationship dynamics and work through fears and anxieties about relationships. Brian, thank you for being willing to be with us for this seminar. We really look forward to having you here. That seminar will begin this coming Friday night at 7 the 5th. It'll go over two consecutive weekends. If you would like to attend, you'll need to register. Also, we've been talking about the Good Grief Seminar for several weeks now. Here's Pastor Adrian to tell us more. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I am excited to share with you about a seminar that you've heard much about already. And this seminar is brought to you by the UKL Department Ministry of our church. The seminar is called Good Grief. From Tears to Joy. This is a seminar that will be hosted by Mike and Pam Tucker, and it's going to be on April the 20th, that's on a Sabbath afternoon, from 2.30 to 5.30. But there is a free luncheon 
from 1.30 to 2.30, but you must register for this event immediately. They, there are only a few seats left, and we definitely want you to have one. But you may say, well, I may not need this event because I'm not really dealing with grief in any kind of way, but I guarantee you, at some point you will, or someone may come to you and say, I need help understanding how to deal with my loss. Or someone may come to you and say, what do I do about this and that related to the loss of a loved one or some friend? And you need to have the tools necessary. Pastor Mike is going to give wonderful tools related to this, and we definitely want you to be a part of this event. So go to LLUC.org, look under Featured Events, and you will see the flyer there, and register as soon as possible, and not only for yourself, but we ask that you will bring someone else with you so they too can be blessed by this amazing event. Our Dementia and Alzheimer's support group is having a special brunch and learn April the 21st from 11 until one o'clock. This is to help all of you who may be dealing with a family member or a friend that suffers from dementia and Alzheimer's. This is moving through life more informed. If this is something that you would like to be a part of, you do need to register. Again, that is April the 21st at 11 until one o'clock, you can register online. Also, just a quick reminder on April 13, there's another fresh picked improv. This time it's gonna be at the Azure Hills Church. That'll be at 7, 7 p.m. at the Azure Hills Church, April 13. As we have mentioned before, our UReach team is putting together a trip to Kenya. If you want more information about that, you can go online. And also, they have an Amazon wish list of materials and supplies to take to Kenya with them. So if you would like to help out in that way, please go to our website and get more details. We mentioned it last week, just another reminder, there is a Reformation tour on st September 5 through the 19th. It's filling up fast. We encourage you to go to the website to check that out. Dr. Michael Campbell, a church historian from the North American Division will be joining us. We really encourage you to check that out. It's gonna be so much fun. Yes, also yeah. this week, you're gonna notice some extra guests on campus. The North American Division Sunscreen Film Festival starts Thursday evening. They're making it available if you're interested in attending both Friday night and Sabbath afternoon. You wanna check that out. Well, a lot of announcements. <laughs> oh, uh, for the latest information, go to our website, LOUC.org. Have a wonderful Easter weekend. We're praying for you as always. We love you guys. Have a wonderful Sabbath day.
Amen, amen. Let's give another appreciation for this wonderful music this morning. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, well, I heard two people. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Amen, amen. It's truly a privilege to be here today and to welcome you to the services here at the Loma Linda University Church. This is a wonderful day. It's a beautiful day outside. You say, really? Yes, it's beautiful because when you think of the rain that falls down, rain refreshes. Rain takes all of the dirt out of the air and it makes things grow nice and beautiful. And that kind of is what's happening today in this service. This is the Easter season. It's also our communion service. And that's when we reflect on Jesus Christ, on his death, on his resurrection, on his life. We're praying that this will refresh your relationship with Jesus Christ. Someone say, man, if you believe that. We want to welcome each of you here today in person, as well as those of you who are watching online. If you're online, if you are at home, if you're sick, if you're um, in a hospital bed, in the nursing home, wherever you are, we want you to know that you are loved, you are appreciated, and that we miss you here today. We want to give you a chance to just greet someone beside you. So just stand up on your feet wherever you are in the audience and greet someone around you and just let them know that they look beautiful, but don't forget to say that so do you as well. Amen. I love it. Look at this. All right. You know, it's recorded in the book of Luke, that wonderful story. After Jesus Christ had risen from the grave, the ladies went to the tomb looking for him. And they became so depressed because they said, oh, my goodness, he's gone. Where is he? And two men dressed in white had compassion on them. And the men said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is risen. He is risen is risen. And because he lives today, my friends, we can face tomorrow and any circumstance that comes our way. So we invite you now to stand to your feet for the hymn of the morning, Christ the Lord is risen today. Welcome, welcome to worship.
even better than first. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> you practice. All right. In between services, good to know. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, <laughs> what an incredible, incredible worship service we are already participating in. It doesn't matter that here in Loma Linda, it's wet outside. And the rain is falling, which, by the way, God, thank you so much for the rain. But, Lord, that rain is not stopping us from worshiping together. And the warmth of the inside of the sanctuary and the worship in song and with instruments, wow, what a taste of heaven we have already experienced. And Father, this is a special weekend. It is a reminder of something very, very profound and special that happened so long ago. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, like that weekend long ago, sometimes our lives look like that. With lows and highs. Like Friday when Jesus died to Sunday when he was raised from the depths of despair to the most glorious and celebrated day. God, thank you for walking and journeying with us in life's lowest and darkest of times. And I know some individuals here are experiencing some pretty horrific things in their lives and maybe in the lives of other people that are close to them. Would you please wrap your loving arms around them and hold them in your embrace? Remind them that their circumstances are not the end. Your resurrection has showed us that hope is forever to be lingering in our hearts because death is not the last say. Lord, there will be a day when we will see all of our loved ones again. Graves will be opened up, and we will be reunited with so many people that we miss. Thank you for the gift of life, and thank you for the gift of raising your son from the grave. And Lord, I pray that every single person here would not only celebrate that today, but every day of their life. A special day is coming very soon, God, but until that day comes, please help us be faithful to you. Uphold us in the times that are trying in our lives. Help us keep our eyes glued and fixed on you. You have all of the answers that we need. And so, God, I pray that when life is tough, that we will remember that you are always there to guide us. As we continue in our worship service today, God, please speak directly to our hearts. We lay them before you and we ask for a special message just for us. And all of those who are not here, God, that are not worshiping with us today, I pray that you will go and that you will attend their needs. And we just give you our hearts. We love you so much and thank you for your resurrection and for the hope we have. A better day is coming. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's a privilege today, along with my colleague Jamie Stadola, to highlight You Thrive Ministry, a ministry in our church that helps step into the pragmatic, real lives, emotionally, relationally, socially, of our church members. So, Jamie, tell us a little bit about what you've just completed in You Thrive Ministry. Right, so we've just completed our Rules of Engagement seminar. It's a four-week uh, series that we do twice a year in the fall and in the spring and it is for our uh, seriously dating or engaged couples. Randy, we really want people to be prepared for marriage Absolutely. but also we want them to have that opportunity to really consider is this going to be a viable relationship for marriage. So uh, that's what we've just finished. Excellent. So that addresses people in the early stages of their relationship but we also, sadly, we have realities of relationship fractures among us. And so there's another ministry that You Thrive sponsors. Yes, this ministry is Divorce Care. We also run that one twice a year in the fall and in the spring. That one is a 13 week long seminar. It's very in depth, going over all of the various mm. kinds of topics that you would need to recover from divorce or being in the process of separation. Absolutely, a very painful time. I'm so thankful we have that as an option here in our church. There are the realities of every relationship, though, whether you're dating or married or a roommate or a colleague at work, and that is sometimes things get pretty tangled up by conflict. Now, in the announcements, you talked a little bit about untangling things in a yeah. seminar that's coming up, mm -hmm. but you and I are partnering in a sermon series together. Yes, yes. Tangled, uh, which will be a three-week sermon series in April, but starting Ap the first weekend of April, we will be having, as, as you highlighted, uh, this Untangling Our Relationships seminar that will be two weeks long because the relationships in between and on top of um, engaged <laughs> or divorce also need attention. And so um, You Thrive tries to provide throughout the year various types of seminars or lectures um, or events that help to address those needs. Absolutely. In addition to that, Jamie, you're a licensed marriage and family therapist. There are consultation therapy services available. This is not long term, but it helps church members step into in their church setting some of the realities they face. What would you add about that? So here at Loma Linda University Church, we also do a fair amount of premarital counseling or pre-engagement counseling, as well um, a sense of consultation uh, for things that people might be going through. Um, oftentimes I find through a conversation that the person really does need ongoing therapy right. and or they just know they need therapy and and sometimes they're looking for that referral so that is another thing that you thrive does excellent that's beautiful and then finally there's a great need for connection in our world mm -hmm. just relational social connections mm -hmm. it's almost more intense after COVID isn't it yes uh, talk a little bit about what you do with connection so connection is another branch of you thrive in which we desire to partner with uh, other areas of our church or community or just on its own provide some kind of event where people could have an opportunity to connect uh, socially to help uh, combat the loneliness in, in society now. I wasn't able to attend the last one that I saw, but I went by and as I looked in, I thought that looks like a great event. Very exciting, so keep your eyes out for that. Now suppose somebody out there, Jamie, is saying, I'd like to get involved with You Thrive. What are the ways that they can get involved? Yes, well, in order to provide many of these seminars and events, uh, it does cost money. So um, your gifts, your, your offerings to caring counseling, uh, as you'll find it in our um, offering system, uh, you can give there directly to this ministry. So care and counseling, financial support, or if you're putting in a tithe envelope, you can write You Thrive on it. That will also get there. Yes. And then second of all is a, a form of volunteering that may mm. look like uh, di helping to direct a program that we find a need for or right. stepping into directing or coordinating something that we already have. Excellent. Uh, one of our amazing volunteers, Joshua Rogers, mm. uh, directs our um, parenting Sabbath school. So mm. that's another thing that we have on SOS, yes, right? Yes, SOS. Uh, Sabbaths, we have a Sabbath school that is dedicated especially to help 
parents connect and go over those kinds of topics. Wow. I have other volunteers that help to facilitate, and that's not to say, however, that I know there are other needs. So Jamie, you thrive is very active just yes. from what you've shared. That's so exciting and it's so needed. You can participate and be blessed and ministered to by this, or you can get involved with financial support or volunteering. Jamie, I want to affirm not only you and your work in ministry, but all of your volunteers. We're grateful for what you do, and we look forward to having you participate. God bless you as we continue to thrive. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This weekend we celebrate Easter. This is a time where God's love becomes most clear to us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that who would ever believe in him would have life eternal. See, God loves us so much that he was willing to give us his best, his only Son. Often in the Bible, when it speaks of God's love, it is defined as him giving us something. This is done because God's will is that he wants to give us his best. God often equates love with giving. This is a part of relationship that designates value, commitment, and caring. So this morning, we have the opportunity to express our love and commitment by giving back to God a portion of that which he has given us. So whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary or from one of our broadcasts, I pray that these tithes and offerings would be used to further God's work so that the next resurrection we have would be the resurrection of our loved ones and that we would be headed home with God forever. And as my dear Uncle Ron taught me many years ago, we say at Easter, he is risen. <laughs> Amen. God bless you.
Happy Sabbath. Our scripture today is taken from Matthew 27, verses 62 to 66. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went, made the tomb secure by posting a guard and sealing on the stone. On your way into worship this morning, you should have received a bag that looks like this. If for some reason you didn't receive one, we have members of our youth department walking the aisles right now, including up in the balcony. If you do not have one, would you raise your hand? Down here to my left, there are some hands right down at the front. Uh, whether you're in the wings or up in the balcony, just keep your hand up. They'll, they'll find you. They're on their way. We want to make certain that each one of you receives a bag. So right down here to my left, down here in the front, and I'm trying to see if I see any others. Maybe I should be checking back here. But I don't see, okay, I see everybody with their bags back here. Excellent. We're glad for that. As you're receiving your bags, I just want to make sure that you understand the context for this. And the context is that when Jesus instituted the meal that we know as the Lord's Supper, when he instituted this meal, it wasn't a thimble full of juice and a tiny wafer. That has changed throughout Christian history. What it was was a meal. His disciples gathered around a table with him. They took part in a meal as Jesus taught them. So we, in an imperfect way, no doubt, attempt to replicate that here today by having the opportunity as the teaching unfolds for you to participate in the meal we know as the Lord's Supper. I think every hand has been tended to, if I can tell. There's one more hand over here on the left in the wings, or my left, I'm sorry, all the way into the wings over here. Now, if you would take out the emblems, the juice, and the unleavened bread, and hold those emblems in your hands. Because we're going to pray and ask God's blessing on these physical symbols of Jesus' broken body and spilled blood, and ask him to bless us as we participate. So while you hold those in your hands, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Gracious God, it doesn't cease to amaze us that you choose the most simple physical elements to represent the most profound spiritual realities. Oil for anointing, water for baptism, bread and juice for the broken body and spilled blood of Christ. But Lord, let us take not just the symbols with appreciation, but understand the realities through the discernment of the Spirit. So bless these symbols today. Bless them to our physical nourishment, yes, but even more so to our spiritual nourishment. And for that, we will thank you. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 So now I invite you to take the bread and follow Jesus' command, take, eat, and to take the juice and to follow his command, drink from it, all of you. And may God bless you as you partake. A couple of moments ago, Steve and Peggy Guptill read and read very well a passage from Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter. I want to go back and reread the last two verses of that passage. Now, just remember the setting, the context. 
The context is, and if you read here, not only in Matthew, but in the other Gospels as well, you get the context of the religious leaders with Pilate. And you get the sense that Pilate has gotten to the point where he's spitting out his words to them. He's sick and tired of them. He's done with them. And now they're back again asking for yet one more thing. He already violated his good conscience by doing what they asked him, releasing him to be crucified. And now they're back again asking, please make the tomb secure. So we pick up again and read the last two verses at that point. Here's what the record says. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. They sealed it. Now we use that term, seal, in a variety of different ways. We, for example, might say they sealed the deal with a handshake. In other words, they reached a conclusion, they're both committed to it, they shook on it, it's sealed. We might use it with a favorite athlete. Oh, finally, he sealed the deal by signing the contract. So now we say, good, our team now has this player that we hoped he would have, we, they would have. He sealed it. Or if you're building your house, you might say to the contractor, be sure you seal the roof with tar and seal the windows with silicone because in Southern California, it rains all the time. And so we use sealed in that fashion. Or in occasion, we might even use it to talk about something like an infectious disease and its spread. We say, okay, the, these people are quarantined. They are sealed off from the rest because we don't want to spread the disease. So we use sealed in a variety of different ways. The way Matthew is using it here as he quotes this conversation between Pilate and the religious leaders is a different way, though. It's what happens when we look at somebody making what we say, how could they make that decision? That's crazy. Why would, why would somebody do that? They just destroyed their life. And the way we describe that is, well, he just sealed his fate. In other words, done, finished, no coming back from that. He sealed his destiny. That is the sense in which Matthew uses it here. Like I said, I love the way Pilate says, make the tomb as secure as you know how. I'll seal it, the Roman seal. I'll provide the guard. It will be sealed. And that will say, done, finished, end of story. Well, hmm. all the world loves a good comeback story, right? Haven't you found that to be true? I've heard that Americans cheer for the underdog because they love a good comeback story. I suspect that's a worldwide reality. All the world loves a good comeback story. So it was, no, it was January 3, 1993. I looked it up just to be sure, but I had it very close to right. My wife was pregnant with our firstborn, Austin. It was just after the new year, still kind of the holiday season. We had guests in town. And you know what you do when guests are there. You in, you talk, you eat, you play games. We were doing all of that, except on that day, on Sunday, it was NFL playoffs. So we turned on the TV to watch a game between the Buffalo Bills and the Houston Oilers. Houston Oilers. Now, if some of you are saying, I never heard of that team. Well, you're probably right, because that team is now the Tennessee Titans. But then it was the Houston Oilers, and it was one of those games that's just a real yawner. Because by the beginning of the second half, Houston was winning the game 35-3. to Buffalo had a backup quarterback. It's done. So we moved into the other room, and we were in there playing, I don't know what it was, Monopoly, Wrist, Rook, something. We were in there playing games. But for some reason, we left the TV on, and I could kind of hear kind of his background noise, white noise. I could hear what was happening in there. And I noticed that the announcers, their voices were going up at times and sound like they were getting excited. And, and so I, I go in to look. And what was 35 to 3 in the third quarter becomes 35 to 10, becomes 35 to 17, becomes 35 to 24, becomes 35 to 31 in the third quarter. And by that time, everybody's in there saying, what is happening? By the time the game ended, Buffalo had won in overtime. It became known as the comeback. 
That's the way they speak of the game because it was against impossible odds, the greatest comeback in NFL history, and all the world loves a good comeback story. Right? Or what about another one from a different arena? The political arena. Don't get twitchy. I'm not going there. (laughs) I'm going back several decades ago to what has been called the most iconic political photograph in American history. Some of you were alive when this happened. I was not, praise God. I was not. This was back. (laughs) This was back a few years ago. Now, the picture that you're looking at is of Harry Truman. He's holding up a copy of the Chicago Tribune. The headline clearly says, Dewey defeats Truman. Except that's not what happened. Truman defeated Dewey. They were certain this was what was going to happen. And because of an early deadline and some bad profits, they decided, okay, we're going with this story. That was the headline. That was the story. And the exact opposite occurred. And Truman won. It was two days later, however, when this photo was taken. He was on a train traveling from his home in Missouri, traveling to D.C. They stopped in St. Louis. Somebody found a copy of the Tribune and stuck it in his hands, and he holds it up. Now, I want to read you the words of Ben Cosgrove. Ben Cosgrove is a writer for Life.com who writes a whole story on this photograph, and he says this about it. He says, The thrill evident in the face of the man holding that paper remains as indelible today as when it was captured all those years ago. In fact, he makes the case in his article that the reason the photo is so iconic is not just because of the wrong headline. Obviously, that was part of it. But it was because of the look on Truman's face. That, he says, is what makes it iconic. He continues, It's a defining image of more than a politician. The picture, listen to this sentence, the picture captures the feeling of sweet, improbable victory for a person who had been counted out too soon. It captures the sweet joy of being signed, sealed, delivered, it's over, done. It's the end of the story, except that, well, actually it's not. So, Buffalo Bills... Harry Truman, Matthew. Matthew writes and says, sealed, stone, guard, finished. Well, turns out God enjoys an incredible comeback story as well. Because then we go to Matthew 28. Now, it's easy to miss this. Say you're reading through the Bible, you're reading a chapter a day, you read Matthew 27, you come to the end of 27, the seal stone, you close your Bible, next day you pick it up, you start at Matthew 28, and and, and you miss the tension that exists between what was just stated and what is now stated. Because with that sealed tomb clearly in view, then Matthew writes this next. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So what happens? Earthquake, dazzling angel, frightened guards, terrified women, and a toppled over stone with an angel seated on it. Do you know when you sit down? You sit down when the job's done. You sit down when the victory's won. You sit down when the battle has been secured. You sit down when the enemy has been defeated. You sit down when what was certain to be the ending wasn't the ending, but this one is. And it says, and the angel Set down. Wow. It doesn't cease to amaze me how the gospel writers 
can tell the most momentous stories with the most simple phrases. Stunning realities, monumental moments, and just a phrase or two. For example, just a page or so before that, Matthew tells us the story of the crucifixion. Now he, as do the other gospel writers, gives us details about all the events surrounding it. What happened in those final days and what happened leading up to that moment. But when it comes to telling the actual moment of the crucifixion, you can almost miss it. Now let that sink in for a moment. This moment, that stands at the pinnacle of human history. This moment that has become the epitome of a statement of love. This moment when we see the heights of God, the grandeur of his love, his willingness to reach to the lowest depths, to to bring his creation back to himself. As has often been said, the pulpit from which Jesus preached his most powerful sermon on love. That moment of crucifixion, if you blink, you miss it. Oh, you get the details around it. But the gospel writers are not going to satisfy our looky-loo carnal curiosity about the macabre events that hap- event that happens there. This is the event about which Paul will let her, later say, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. I want, to, I want you to notice how Matthew tells it. This is not too many verses before the one we read earlier, Matthew 27, verse 32. As they were going out, we're going to get the scenes. We're going to get some of the details around it. As they were going out, they met a man from Simon named Simeon, pardon me, from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Now, here comes how Matthew tells the moment of the crucifixion. When they had crucified him. That's it. Not satisfying any curiosity here. Not drawing any macabre pictures here. Not titillating the, the bloodlust of people. He just says, when they had crucified him. And then he goes on to other details. They divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Stunning. Stunning in its simplicity. But if it tells us anything, it tells us when we're reading these gospels, when we're reading what happened at the end of Jesus' life, Pay attention to the little details because a great deal can be contained in very simple words. We read it just a few moments ago. Here we have a sealed tomb. End of story. His destiny, his fate, says Pilate and the priests and the Pharisees and the religious leaders is done. And Matthew says, rolled back the stone and set on it. Simple. I want to read you the words of two New Testament scholars who comment on this. First, Michael Wilkins, who writes, entrances to burial tombs were sealed in a variety of ways. This one was sealed by a cylindrical stone that rolled up a trough, which was wedged open while a body was being attended inside the chamber. Matthew alone relates that as the angel of the Lord rolls away the stone, he sits on it. The stone that was sealed by the guards to assure that the body of Jesus would remain in the crypt now becomes the seat of triumph for the angel. The stone is rolled away not to let the risen Jesus out, but to let the women in to witness the fact of the empty tomb. Catch that carefully because the gospel writers themselves will tell us later in the days after Jesus' resurrection that he apparently, I'm just saying, reporting what they say, 
goes through closed doors and walls to be with them when they've shut everyone else out. And suddenly, it's, where did you come from? Thus, Wilkins' point, the stone is rolled away not to let him out, but to let us in. So that once we get in, we see something has happened here. I've had the wonderful privilege of being at the place that probably with some pretty good evidence is where Calvary was and where the tomb was. And I've stood in line waiting to get into that tomb. And when finally we got into that tomb, we stood there and were overwhelmed with one reality that's captured in three words. It is empty. Empty. There's no one here. Arnold Toynbee wrote, find the bones of that Jew and Christianity crumbles into ruins. The problem is they never did find them because it was empty. And when the women were there and they were viewing the empty tomb, there was an angel outside chilling out. God, he says, loves a good comeback story. And you have just witnessed the greatest one of all. Now, last night, here in this sanctuary, we went to Gethsemane. We went to that garden where Jesus fought the true battle. Here, Jesus was fighting with the reality that faced him, the human nature within him that didn't want to be separated from the Father or endure what was coming. Jesus, falling to the ground, the gospel writer said, as though dead, Luke adds, sweating great beads of perspiration as though it were great drops of blood and crying out to his Father, Father, please take this cup away. Please. But then he ends, nevertheless, not my will, but yours that's where the battle is fought. Because when Jesus walks out of Gethsemane, now under guard, the decision has been made. Now he's going to face the realities of the consequences of the decision he made. And now what he says is very different. No longer is it, Father, take this cup away. That has been decided. Now it's, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. It's women, don't, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. It's a different Jesus because the decision has been made. And thus we stood in Gethsemane last night, and with apologies to the musician Crowder, we said, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't feel. Because if you go into Gethsemane, the one thing of which you can be certain is you're not the first one there. Jesus has already been there. There is nothing you feel or experience that heaven can't also feel and hasn't also felt. But that was last night. That was Gethsemane. Today, we're in a garden at a tomb, and it is empty. And so as we stand at that tomb, we are not saying earth has no sorrow that heaven can't feel. Now we're saying earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal because God loves a good comeback story. Somebody here today is at that dead end. You're standing at that sealed tomb. It's as though that Roman guard stands facing you saying your story is over. It's done. It may be physical a grim diagnosis. It may be marital, an impenetrable and yet invisible wall that separates the two of you. It may be professional. I don't know where to go next. I don't know what that dead end at the tomb is for you, but I do know this. God loves a good comeback story, and he's told the greatest one of all. There's a lot I don't know, I don't know how he will turn it around for you. Maybe through natural causes that God has created when he created a world with causes and consequences. Maybe through medicine and science. It may be through some move of the Spirit. 
in a marriage counseling office. I don't know how he'll do it. I don't know when he'll do it. Don't know if he'll do it now or tomorrow or next year or when the kingdom is finally and fully realized. I don't know whom he will use to do it. Whether it will be someone trained in the art and opening their life to God and therefore they're guiding your marriage, guiding your professional life, guiding your physical treatment. And I don't know where he'll do it. Whether it's here in a worship service or in a clinician's office or a therapist's couch or some morning when you are worshiping him alone in nature, I don't know where he'll do it. So there's a lot I don't know. But there is one thing I do know. One thing in which I am confident. One reality on which I have staked my life. And it can be stated very simply, and that is this. When you come to that dead end, that tomb that is sealed, that guard that stands in your way, whatever else may be true about all that we don't know, this is true. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen indeed.
And may now the grace and power of our good God, the love of the resurrected Son, Jesus Christ, and the presence and grace of the Spirit go with you today and every day as you go out to live the resurrected life of Jesus in the world. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Two things. One, you would be of tremendous help to us if you would take your bags with you and recycle them at home. We had everything all set up, and then the rain just melted away our cardboard boxes in every way that we were going to take care of it. So you would be of great help to us. And now I invite you to stay seated for a magnificent postlude.
Hello, everybody. Surely all of you agree with me that the services at University Church, Sabbath by Sabbath, the messages and the music are such a wonderful blessing. And I just want to say, encourage everybody you can to tune in with us. And today, more greetings. Hello, Fabiola Guzman, Calhoun, Georgia. Happy birthday, lady. And you know how to enjoy life. They're snuggled in with family also. Yvonne Stratton, College Place, Washington. Happy birthday, Yvonne. And glad to see you with friends Jiggs and Donna and another friend. Mary Stokas, Lomeland University Church. Happy birthday, Mary, and so good to see you with friend Jolene. Jefferson Richards, Dr. Richards, and there he is a while ago with Mother Kirsten, and at Loma Linda Matching with Maddie, and at Loma Linda Commencement. Congratulations, Jefferson. Bo Gerber, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Happy birthday, Bo, and there with Dad Bill, and with a darling niece. Bethany Gerber, Walla Walla University, proud owner of Honda Wheels, I see, and with Mother Bonnie, and then sporting license plates with Grandma Juliet. Christian Schultz, Santa Clarita, California. Happy birthday, beautiful cake, by the way, and then with Dad, Scott, and sister, and with Mother Sheila, both grandmothers and sister. Happy birthday, Christian. Russ Nelson, Colton, California. Hello, Russ. Happy birthday to you, sir. And there with dear wife, Paulette. Ruben Escalante, Riverside, California. Happy birthday, Ruben. There you are with wife, Penny. And then with friends. And Ruben is the one with the tie. Shirley Tucker, Loma Linda. 88th birthday, Shirley. All the very best to you, lady. And thank you, Blanche. Sharman Bowes, Battleground, Washington. Happy birthday to you. And so good to see you with husband, Rick. Jacqueline, Jackie, Channer, 90th birthday, Jackie. Congratulations, lady, glad to be reminded. Dr. Schubert, Atiga, Riverside, California. Hello, Shu, happy birthday, man, and delighted to see you with dear Karen. Ralph Watts III, Lodi, California these days, and there he is with Sharon while they were still in Hawaii, then with grandson enjoying his retired life, and with brother Mark Etchell, joined by Ron Cluzet in 1986 at their ordination. Richard Dick Dirksen, Portland, Oregon. Hello, Dick. Happy birthday there with Brenda. And then with Sheba. And by the way, folks, if you want some of the best photos around, join Dick's Friday Photos. George Swanson, Mead, Colorado. Hello, George. Great memories, man. Happy birthday there with Ada. And then with one of your sons at graduation time. Eric Laudenschlager, Loma Linda, happy birthday, Eric. So good to see you with your sons and then with wife, Colleen. Jody Nichols, hi, Jody, happy birthday. There with Glenn. And then there you are flanking a group of family members, Eric and Ginny Anderson. 12th anniversary for you two. Congratulations, there you were, here you are. And look at your darling daughters. Kevin Denton, Eagle, Idaho. My grandnephew, and there he is with sisters, Janelle, Nicole, and Kimmy. Vicky Salerno, New Plymouth, Idaho. My niece, happy birthday, Vicky. And there you are with husband Ken and with your grandchildren, Victor and Danilo Braga, a part of Loma Linda Media. They helped me make these greetings possible. There they are visiting Brazil with their cousin, who is the general of that military installation, and I greet this identical twins. Be sure to greet Danilo, who is three seconds older than Victor. Love you guys, thank you. Reggie Allen, Loma Linda, California. Hello, Reggie, happy birthday there with dear wife, Jeanette. And man, do you know how to golf with Alfred Palmer. Roland Rhinus and I share the same birthday and he let me share his hat. Happy birthday, Roland. And I share the birthday with Joyce Reiswig, now in Temecula. Happy birthday, sister. Glad to see you with husband, Dr. Phil, and then with your great-grandchildren. Hi, Betty Simcock, Walla Walla, Washington. Also share a birthday, and there she is with husband, Manford. Walt Nelson, Beaumont, California. Happy birthday to you, Walt, and glad to see you with wife, Dee Dee, and your family. 
Nicole Dennis, Loma Linda, California. I am so proud of this lady. She is Dr. Dennis, and I've been greeting her for a few years now, and there she is with Mother Simone and a friend. Colleen Walters, Pickering, Ontario, Canada. Happy birthday, Colleen, and glad to see you with husband Fenwick. Jerry Friesen, Loma Linda. Happy birthday, Jerry, and so good to see you with dear Billy. Your wife, I think, of 73 years now. Evelyn Connell, Happy Valley, Oregon. Congratulations on another birthday, Evelyn. There with a friend. And then Bert finally got in one of your photos. Donda Lee Meyer, Loma Linda, California. Hello, Donda Lee. Happy birthday. There with husband Walter and then with son David. And Joyce Benfield, Spokane, Washington. Happy birthday, Joyce. There between your sisters, Linda and Karen, with husband Ron. And then your sisters with you again and mother, late mother Millie. Well, that's it for one more time, and I look forward to God's blessing for all of us this coming week.